online is just a mirror of how we live our lives offline. It's a product of our culture. Hey, hello, and welcome to the Green Stocking Society. My name is Shara, I'm a philosophy grad, and I work in sustainable fashion. And on this channel, we like to talk about all things sustainability, feminism, and today we're gonna to be tackling recent stories of online misogyny um, and talking a little bit about what the problem is, what can be done, and overall just showing that this is kind of exactly why we still need feminism. So recently we learnt that reality TV star Georgia Harrison's ex-boyfriend Stephen Bear has just been jailed for 21 months following sharing an intimate video of them without her consent online. He uploaded a video of them having sex which was filmed without her consent to OnlyFans which means he literally earned money from it, up to about £2,000 from the subscribers that he had on there. The other really disgusting thing about this case is the footage of him outside the courthouse where he's refusing to apologise, he's refusing to answer any of the reporter's questions, and he's basically saying that everyone's already made up their mind about him, so there's nothing left for him to say. But despite all of that, of course, the Daily Mail still ran with a headline that said that he is a broken man after not expecting to be jailed for uh, any length of time for this literal crime. Shout out to today's sponsor, hashtag male entitlement. And this week the ITV released a documentary with Georgia going through her personal experience of the trial and also diving into the changes that she wants to see in terms of law for convicting these crimes. So this case has been called a case of revenge porn. The government website defines that as the sharing of private sexual materials, either photos or videos, of another person without their consent and with the purpose of causing embarrassment or distress. Georgia has said that that last part is not really necessary and it's just another hurdle uh, which really slows down the process of getting convictions for these crimes. She's teamed up with the women's charity Refuge to call on the government to amend the online safety bill to provide better protections for women and also to speed up the response time to these crimes. The bill must recognise exactly how women and girls experience this abuse online to be able to put measures in place at tech companies to tackle it. Before we go on, the word revenge actually implies that it's the fault of the victim, that they did something um, that caused the person who committed the crime to act out in revenge, but often this isn't even the case, it's not like it's been prompted or it's been provoked, and even if it was, it's still criminal. But anyway, um, so for the rest of the video we're going to use the term image-based sexual abuse instead. In the UK, image-based sexual abuse has been its own crime as part of the Criminal Justice and Courts Bill since 2015, with a sentence of up to two years, and um, about 200 people have been convicted under the law so far. This really is a gendered crime, with upwards of 90% of the victims being women. And just to illustrate the massive impact that this can have on a person's life, 53% of the victims have had suicidal thoughts and 93% of the victims suffer significant emotional distress. So this is something that really upends your life and your mental health. The UK law says that both online and offline media can be counted as image-based sexual abuse, but with the rise of social media, it's really clear that nowadays it's really easy to post something and make it go viral and completely destroy a person's life within hours. And that brings us to the central point that I really want to emphasise in this video, which is that because the youngest generation is always going to have access to the latest and newest technologies, there's always going to be more opportunities for misogyny and sexism to express themselves. Even if we've made progress in some areas of gender equality, if we don't tackle the overarching ideology of misogyny and sexism, it will basically just rear its ugly head in whatever new technologies we develop. It will just transform rather than being eradicated. Some people think of the internet as this oasis for free speech and a place where everyone can have their voices heard, but that's quite an idealistic way of thinking about it. We have to remember that as researchers Laura Hilly and Kira Alman write, the internet is a social product. It is grounded in societies that exist online and offline and therefore replicates deep offline social inequalities, including the marginalization of women. So everything that happens online is just a mirror of how we live our lives offline. 
It's a product of our culture. And because we have a patriarchal society offline where women aren't treated as equals, it's no surprise that that online translates into trolling and abuse and silencing women's voices. And thanks to the internet, people can now do this completely anonymously with basically no consequences. And because we're just obsessed with victim blaming, just as we ask a woman what she was wearing the night that she was assaulted, instead of protecting women and girls from their intimate and private images and videos being shared online, we are shaming them for taking those pictures and videos in the first place. As if the real problem is that they've put themselves in a position where sharing that intimate content is even possible. No one can release your nude photos if you don't take nude photos, right? Simple. <laughs> Except there's a massive difference between what a woman does in her private sphere and what she consents to in her private sphere versus what she consents to in the public sphere. So this is like the difference between a woman consenting for other people to see a lot of her body when she wears a bikini to a public beach. She's consenting in that particular time, on that particular day, for those particular people on that particular beach to see her in that particular way. But that doesn't mean that, say, if you saw her on that beach in that bikini, you then have the right to say, like, look through her bedroom window and spy on her getting changed while she's in her underwear, even though she might be revealing the same amount of skin, because she didn't consent to you seeing that and seeing her in that position in that particular sphere at that particular time. So context is everything with consent. So it's very, very different to consent to someone taking a picture or a video of you, which you believe will only be used for private purposes. That's very different to consenting to have it leaked online without you even being consulted or completely against your wishes for literally anyone to see and for your career to be ruined and your reputation to be ruined. Those two things are very different things to consent to. A related issue is that we love to kind of pin all this onto a few bad apples. So like Stephen Bear or Andrew Tate, we like to single out these people and say, oh, that's just, that's one bad man doing bad criminal things. It's not, you know, general. Whether we're talking about victim blaming or um, assuming that it's just a few bad apples, it's so much easier for us to focus the problem on that one individual and say that they're the problem and kind of externalize it rather than internalize it and actually confront the fact that we might be part of upholding those systems that are leading to these issues. At which point it becomes a much bigger and much more personal problem that we all have to tackle together, and that's harder. Coincidentally, just this week, Baroness Louise Casey released a 300-page report detailing how the Met Police is institutionally misogynistic, racist, and homophobic. Playing the institutional and the systemic card is so much harder than just pointing the finger at one person. But to solve issues like image-based sexual abuse, we actually have to look at the system. Freedom of speech online sometimes just seems to translate to the freedom to troll women and to engage in gendered hate speech, when we should be talking about how we can better protect women's and girls' voices online to make it a safe space for them. I really hope that George's story is gonna encourage lots more people to speak about their experiences and to kind of destigmatize this whole thing and, and step us away from this victim-blaming narrative. If you wanna help me spread that message, this is the point in the video where I ask you to hit the like button so that this content can spread to more people and keep these conversations going. So what can we actually do about this? Social media and tech companies have a massive role to play in combating crimes like image-based sexual abuse. Google can already remove search results on request um, where intimate content has been shared without your consent, which is a good first step, but more needs to be done considering that these crimes can literally ruin a whole woman's life, her career, her reputation, especially if she is a content creator or an influencer and a lot of her life is kind of lived online. In February 2022, new measures were brought in in the UK to make sure that social media companies and tech companies are taking down this kind of harmful material and they can be fined up to as much as 10% of their global turnover or even banned from operating in the UK if they don't comply with that. They have to spot and remove this content, they have to ban certain search phrases, and they also have to stop people who have been banned on the platform from re-registering using new names. However, 
However, the online safety bill, which covers all of this, has been criticised for being too weak and not tackling the problems effectively. Twitter banned image-based sexual violence on its platform in 2015, followed closely by Reddit. However, the CEO at the time, Ellen Pau, actually then had to resign just eight days later because of the abuse that she received online for introducing the new rules. Tech companies should be focusing on protecting their most vulnerable users, even if it comes at the expense of some of their most abusive users taking offense or even leaving the platform. God forbid. Marianne Franks, who is a professor at the Miami University of Law, summed it up when she said that, like domestic violence and sexual assault, non-consensual pornography is the product of a culture that does not view women as fully human and deserving of the same rights of bodily autonomy as men. It is not a matter of changing our laws or our technology or our culture, it is a matter of changing all of them. So we need changes to the law and then we need changes to how social media and tech companies operate, but we also need a cultural shift. And that is why we still need this fight for gender equality and for feminism. Sexism hasn't been eradicated. A lot of it's just gone online and therefore become invisible and anonymous. If you want to support some of the organisations that are working to protect women from crimes like this, you can support places like the Revenge Porn Helpline, Refuge or Women's Aid. I'll leave links to those um, in the uh, comments below and in the description as well. If you are like me and you believe that this conversation around online misogyny needs to be a part of this larger feminist movement that is still relevant in 2023, then do hit that like button and subscribe and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this so make sure to comment below as well and I'll see you there. Stay kind, see you next time, bye!